Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly gathering of IOs, HRs, recruiters, and one actor as we try to navigate the world of business and try to make it a little better place. Jeremy, today we're going to talk about upskilling and reskilling strategies for continuous learning and development. Uh, you know, someone who's got gray hair, this is a really good topic because the world of work is constantly changing. And um, how do I adapt? First, you adapt by. Uh me turning off my mic so I can so I can be heard. That's the first key because we'll be talking about technology. I'm gonna go ahead and put the I'm posting in the chat. I may have just turned my oh I think I just turned my mic off. See I hit the space bar accidentally. I guess that's a zoom feature. I need some reskilling and upscaling Tom. I'm putting into the chat the references for today. The one we're gonna actually focus on uh is it's called reskilling and upskilling the future ready workforce for industry 4.0 and beyond by Ling Li. There's some other great references there. One is a, a, a lengthy book as well. These are all resources that you can find on Scholar on the web. So they are, you know, anyone can access them. And of course, we'll put those into the show notes. The reason we're going to focus on this particular one by Ling Li is it's there's so much to talk about. And they pull data from a lot of different uh, a lot of different places, and there's just so much in here that I think that's the one that we're going to focus on. <clears throat> Word of caution for all of us, because it's it's so easy to get into the why we need to reskill and upskill. We all need to, and please help me out if I go astray. How to do it? So, what are some of the best practices? Because again, the topic for today is strategies for continuous learning and development. So we want to make sure we keep keep our brains there because it's just so easy to go in different directions. So I'm going to start off uh, within this article. So this is this is recent, uh, June 23rd, 2022. So that's good. Uh, there's things about AI in here. There's some pretty, at least for Tom and I, going to be some shocking, uh, some some shocking data in here. But I'll start off just with a little bit. So five, and this is from the article, five years from now, over two thirds of skilled of skills considered important in today's job requirements will change. A third of the essential skills in 2025 will be technology competencies, not even yet regarded as crucial in today's job requirements. That's just two years from now and just three years from when the, the study was published. So when you look at what is industry 4.0, industry 4.0 is the process verbatim, the process of revolutionizing manufacturing and engineering all over the world. But I wanted to make sure in, in looking at looking into this paper that it's not just focused on manufacturing engineering. And it's not because it's everything that goes into that. We're looking at HR, we're looking at, I mean, they get into educational requirements, higher education, all kinds of different organizations, industries. But in general, that's what we look at because those are the kind of the nuts and bolts of industry per se. So they also provide a nice blueprint as a reference. And we love our blueprints. We talk about that all the time. What's the use of, what's one of the main uses of having these articles and, and having this podcast is that people can start to say, here's what I want to do. And then we can provide references, talk about it and provide some kind of a starting point, which is always important. And of course, a blueprint that people can say, I want to do this so I can focus on X, Y, and Z to break it down even to the ridiculous to make things manageable, manageable in chunks. So of course, from this study, we, we could guess this. Findings of the study suggest that lifelong learning should be a part of an organization's strategic goals. Okay, that's got it. Um, both the individuals and the companies need to commit to reskilling and upskilling. We're talking about the phase, phases of the company, phases of um, career development. Tom, I'm going to turn it back into you because right now, if I keep going, I'm going to go down some rabbit holes, but I'm going to let you choose the rabbit hole. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm old enough that I remember very, very early in my working career that we all got those little square Mac computers, you know, the, the very first ones that were out. And it had all these wonderful applications like spreadsheet. 
which, you know, never seen before. And I got to learn how to use all those. But then I started to notice, you know, positions were requiring that training that, you know, you had to know how to use a computer. Uh, and now it's, it's AI is coming. So how do I use, you know, artificial intelligence? How are all these things going to affect me? Um, and am I too old to learn? I mean, luckily, I've been a lifelong learner. Thanks for the dirty look, Linda Ann. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, technology is increasing. And my daughters tell me, you know, if I want to learn anything today, it's, it's YouTube, that I should just look on YouTube. Although I'm not sure in this situation, that's probably the best source to be going with. It's interesting that you mentioned mentioned that. So there, there's two examples in here that I I thought were just quite re- ridiculous, and I'm thinking, what is what is this instrument, this technological instrument that they're mentioning? Before I mention that, though, because we get into the how to, so setting a little bit of a baseline here, because you're asking at you know different age groups and different, uh, you know, of course, there's buy in, there's ability. There's everything like that involved. Just a quick how to some of the thoughts, some of the, just the quick sentences I came up with while I was doing this research, focus on self career interest of the, of the other person or people break it down with the ridiculous examples, which I will share, make sure there's follow through great support. Um, make sure you, you your the company and the person considers it an investment for the career adva- advancement. And when you're looking at, incorporating new tools even as even something as complex as is as, as ai find ways to make it easy uh navigable create sandboxes allow people to play in these sandboxes where it's okay to make mistakes think about it and ter- I, I always go back to this when when you get a new phone if you ever like switch to a new phone or right now the next version of a phone is pretty much the same version of the phone, except for stuff that we don't understand about the new model. But when you look back in 2010, a new model came out, it's kind of a big deal, lots of different stuff, but you have to play around with it. And you know, you spend three hours doing it, all of a sudden you get it. It's the same thing with technology. If you want to do it, if you have the want to want to do it, that's important. The other thing I'll suggest is put people in in charge of leading the charge who you wouldn't normally put in charge. And there's an example in some of the research, if we get to that, uh, that I recall that validates this idea where you're taking staff and you're elevating them to to learn something and then teach to other people. We've talked about third three-person teaching here, where when you learn something with the mindset of, I'm I'm going to need to teach someone else. We start to use different analogies in our own brain, use something called elaborative rehearsal. So those are important things too. Tom, back to your point. This, there's a, a, a called a blurb in here in this article under the head under the uh, look at the headline defining reskilling and upskilling through college education. And it's on page ten, I think. <clears throat> upskilling means that employees gain new skills to help in their current job responsibility. Tom, you're talking about your old MacBook. This gave me, I don't even know if it was a chuckle or a confused grin. For example, an accountant who used to use an abacus for accounting and computing learns digital spreadsheets to balance the company's spreadsheet. On the other hand, rescaling means that they might need to take on an entirely new role. For example, a switchboard operator position disappeared after the cell phone became a primary communication device. So... This answers, to me, this actually answers a lot of questions. These two, (laughs) Tom, I first, I was an abacus. And then I I, like the picture that I had in my brain, I realized was a sextant, like the the marine navigational tool, because I just got those words mixed up in my mind. And then I thought, I think I know what an abacus is. I'm, I'm not too proud to say I went to Google and I just, I just want to make sure. And I had to Google a picture of it. And I was like, Oh, it's the things that your three and your four year old, year old play with when they slide the little things back and forth. And I'm thinking they used to use those for accounting and computing, but I guess that that's a type of computing technology. Um, but this answers a lot of questions for me because a, it points to the fact that just because technology People get scared. Am I going to lose my job? Technology comes. And we have some answers in this particular article, which we'll get to. 
but it, 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 if you're upskilling and reskilling, it also made me think when I took a broad look at this article, the organizations who say, ah, we're not going to get on board. We're just going to stay. We're going to continue to make sure nothing goes wrong. That's a dangerous place because even when you think it just, I mean, think of education. I mean, we've seen the numbers on how uh, poorly American students are doing and how we're, we're ranking against other countries and even in, in areas within within the country, the educational system you know, needs a lot of work. Same thing. If you're a company, you've got to think about it in terms of, yes, you're a company. What if you were a town of people? Now, what if you were a country of people and you didn't educate? Think of if you're a company, if you were a, a town and you didn't school your kids, nobody went to school. What would happen to that town? And nobody learned to trade. What would happen to that town? going and going and going. Same thing with the company. It's important because we've got to get a little bit into the analogies and the why for companies to, to, for it to matter and not only matter, be a priority, but also a sense of urgency. And it's strange because it's got to be a sense of urgency that never dies. So you've got to have a sense of urgency as a company, put this as a, a main staple, a main pillar of your business, but also be strategic, don't go too far too fast. It, it is a marathon. It's not a race. Uh, but that urgency is key, Tom. Yeah, we, we're in a technology revolution. So it's not like we're going to stop evolving tomorrow. Uh, this is going to be continuous. But, you know, two questions pop into my head. One is, are IO psychology programs in universities, are they looking at this so that IO psychologists are being trained not for what's happening today, but what's you know, where we're going to be in three or five years. Um, and then what, you know, it, it's really interesting talking and looking at different organizations because some are very much, we want to be on the cutting edge. We want to be progressive, but there are lots of organizations who want to sit back and be maybe the second or third, you know, to go down that path. They want to make sure someone's proven it first. So, are we doing okay on the educational side? And how do we move those businesses which are slow to innovate onto a faster track? Ooh. So as far as IO programs, it's an interesting and any anyone can feel free to correct me because I'm not solid on this response. There seems to be a bit of a divide in IO programs. IO traditionally was if you wanted to get into IO you wanted to do research and you wanted to be in academia. You know, we're talking again, IO program has been around for a long time. IO is a very old field, but just kind of newly recognized. So now there's this push towards uh, practitioner oriented uh, IO psychology programs where they're saying, look, we're not training you to be, to go into academia and do the research. We're training you to, really truly bridge that gap between research and practice and work in the workplace work internally work externally work in an io role be a practitioner rather than a scholar so there's a difference there and i imagine from from what from my review and from talking to some io directors for these practitioner based schools Yes, they are focusing on these types of things and what is important and moving forward. And of course, when you have your IO psychology programs that are geared more towards academia, of course, they're still doing what needs to be done per this in terms of the research topics. You know, they're not still researching how to use an abacus. They're researching how to use AI and how AI might be beneficial in the workforce. Um, I'll add uh, I highlighted this, so I'll mention that because it starts with the word universities, per your question. Universities with a tradition of education and training the world's most competent designers, engineers, technology specialists, consultants, operation professionals, and data analysts are in an exciting era to tackle these challenges quickly and collaboratively. So the time is now. This kind of goes back to your so this will go back to your other which i will say tom you gave me two completely non-related questions for me to remember and somehow i remember them so your other question was some companies want to sit back 
and uh, let someone go first. Make sure, look, they're blazing a path, they're blazing a trail, they're doing the right things, and we'll learn from their mistakes. <clears throat> it's funny because I've seen, I've seen both research and anecdotal information on, hey, it's better to, to like look at companies who blaze the trail and go first. They're the better ones. And then you look at those who sit back and let everyone else do it. Those are the better ones. So, you know, I guess that's a, a, a nice debate topic. Um, I will say this, the organizations, whether you're sitting back or whether you're the first to go, take a look at your population and meet them where they're at. The European, in the study, the European Commission in, in 2020 estimated that less than two in five adults participate in learning every year in the EU which is not enough to support the needs of industry 4.0. So if they're not accustomed to learning, I mean, you're looking at that small of a percentage. If they're not accustomed to learning, you've got more, you've got more than simply getting buy-in uh, as a challenge. You've got to make sure if you're the one that's sitting back, start revving those engines now, start getting them accustomed to learning, start, getting them excited about it, start creating uh, learning advocates and ambassadors within the company. If you're more poised and, and you're the kind of company that says, look, we're going to go for it now, identify those two and five adults, and then take the third one and the fourth one who are saying, ah, I haven't done much, but I want to. So it's really about recognizing the employees who either are the go-getters or have it in them but just need some some of the challenges, some of the blockades removed to allow them uh, to progress, to move forward, and to get to where they want want to be with the upscaling requirements. Well, thank you. You did a very good job, but giving me answers to two totally unrelated questions. Um, well done, uh, Linda Ann. Let's go to you. Yeah, I love I love this topic, and I think that um, it's it's so multifaceted. Uh, you know, organizations really need to think about how they're going to lead their teams through that learning process. And the assumption I think that happens a lot of times is that leaders think that they need to know all the information and have all the answers. And that's not necessarily true. You know, one of the things that, one of the ways that some of this uh, upskilling and reskilling and, and evolution can happen is if you just look at completely utilizing the scope of any of the softwares that you have. And those organizations are going to be constantly evolving. And so if you're just staying up with that, that will help push you. That's one way. Um, so that you, because they're already doing the research on how do we compete in the market, right? The other thing is um, when you're, who's going to be your visionary in your organization? Who's that person who wants to push you? It doesn't have to be a top manager. It has to be that person who is, is you know, for lack of a better term, the geek in the organization who just loves figuring it out and, and bringing it to the organization and, and having that open door, that open mind to evaluate some of the ideas some of them will be great some of them will be won't work for your organization but but having that person or people who who love doing it the other thing too is um making sure that you've got really up-to-date job descriptions and if you have a really good system for job descriptions you're going to have components in there that will identify what are the technical responsibilities, what are the overall expectations, what are the managerial responsibilities, what um, uh, leadership communication responsibilities, all those things that are expected for those particular positions. And then people can look at them. And what, what I do is I have the performance uh, process, but there's a career development plan uh, that's organized through career objectives, through skill sets that they need, and they can look at the next job that they want, identify the skills that they need for that next job, put it into their career development plan, and then they can evaluate, okay, what's the, sca the skill gap analysis? What do I need to get training on? And they can create that 
plan for themselves in conjunction with their their managers, their leaders, and it's a and then that creates your succession plan for you. Not only that, but it, it's also typically organ, um, aligned with the organizational goals. And so it's a very integrated process, but it's it doesn't have to be rocket science. Do we, do we though, have to be careful about having that conversation with employees? Because in my mind, I'm picturing a scenario where we're adapting, we're changing, we're, you know, things are totally going to move forward here. And here's a, the job descriptions of all the, you know, new roles we're going to have. Uh, and I might not see my role in that list, the current one I'm in. So, you know, to me, that's, does, does the organization want to get rid of me? <laughs> or do we have to have that conversation about, we've got great talent here, we want to move you forward? Because I often notice that development programs for employees kind of usually boil down to we want you to take one or two training courses per year and there's no sort of planning it's just what are you interested in and and there's no sort of how do we work with the employee on their development to make not only the employee better but our organization so do we have to have more conversations around that I think, but more conversations are better than less conversations, <laughs> you know, and it's going to, and I think there's also a, a shift that has to happen in the mindset of anybody who wants to lead people. And that is leading people going forward is a job in and of itself. You may have technical responsibilities, but leadership is work and it's a skill set that's um, uh, an art form. and people need to understand that being an effective leader and leading people through these processes is a a very conscious process and it's a lot of work. Yeah, it it certainly can be. And I think it's Jeremy, you said many times you manage projects, you lead people, Um, (laughs) but there's a lot of, you know, leaders out there are managers out there who think they're leaders, but they're really managers. So uh, it's all very interesting. And Jeremy, let's go back to you. First, we give ourselves a pat on the back for staying on the strategy part and not falling in too much to the why. So that's that's good. I'm I'm loving this conversation. I'm gonna talk to I have a something to say about Linda Ann's. I, I got something to say. Nobody wants to hear about Linda Ann's uh uh job description thing. I just have an idea on how managers can use this that with employees as a tool. But first. I keep talking to people and uh, they keep saying, Hey, I didn't even know. Cause I'll, I'll suggest, Hey, another way, you know, raise your hand on the work cookie podcast while we're doing the recording and we'll tag you. You can put it up on your LinkedIn featured in that you spoke that you contributed. And they say, Oh, I didn't even know we could. So I need to, and Tom, maybe you can help me remind everyone, anyone who's listening, uh, these events, these particular events are open mic. You can get your ticket to cboc.com slash events. And anyone that says public event, those are going to be the recording ones. Or if it's at a Thursday at noon EST. And if you're in the audience, all you have to do is raise your hand and Tom will call on you. We would love to hear from absolutely everyone, different perspectives uh, on that note. Linda Ann mentioned with the uh, updated job descriptions. With lots of organizations, I mean, there are plenty of people who's, who have worked within an organization for four or five years and haven't looked at their job description in since. So one activity <clears throat> that I think is very helpful is for that job description. So whether it's, I guess, during review time, annual review time, but really it should be a couple of times a year or maybe just during your meetings that you have with your with your employees. And if you're an employee, suggest to do this with your manager. Print out your job description. Each person has a copy. And one easy thing to do, it's a conversation piece. It's a real good conversation piece. Just take three different color high- markers or highlighters. Green, yellow, red. Green for what's going well with your on the job description for that particular bullet. Yellow uh, for what's not going too well. Red, of course, red alert. It's an easy example, and it's an e- it's almost like an, an easy icebreaker because it gives both the employee and the manager the opportunity 
to start to bring things up and talk about maybe some uncomfortable conversations with a, a, a third party involved. And that third party is simply a piece of paper, but it's, it's something that I found that works really well. And the other thing to do, you can still, you can play around with it too. Hey, you know, if I had an employee, it'd be in a perfect world, what would this look like? What, what might this job description look like in three years or five years? How will that change? Maybe you don't ask five years because they want to get promoted. You might say, until you get promoted, how, how will this job description look? But these are just really easy activities. And it also helps, even if you can't formally change a job description because you've got so many hoops and red tape to jump through, you can still use that as an activity to start to shape the current job description in a way that makes sense for the current organizational goals, which oftentimes goals change often yearly, sometimes more often for the organization, but a lot of times they just don't know about them until they come out. So when you're looking at reskilling, here, here's where I do my due diligence, Tom, and I re say the name of the podcast, reskilling and upskilling, and then strategies for continuous learning and development and organizations. That's when you can start to say, what are we looking to do? What are these skills that are going to be in high demand? And how can we how can we start to dip our foot in the water of these top skills? I'll mention I'll mention that there are in this particular article, there are two really good tables in terms of the skill, the top skills on reskilling and upskilling for a future ready workforce. I can't help but I can't help but get in, into this a little bit. So in 2025. Actually, I'm not going to get into this because it's going to take us on a different track. I know it is because this is the um, this is the shocking stuff, Tom. So I'll leave that teaser up there because there's some other hands up. Tom, back over to you. I can't wait. I love to be teased. Uh, Aaron, let's go to you. Hey, Tom, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I mean... Dr. Jeremy was like, I'm not going to pivot, but I'm going to go ahead and pivot for him. So when we think of reskilling and upskilling, the first thing we think is, okay, what do we need to actually put into place? You know, we're looking at job descriptions. What do we need to do to boost our you know, reskill and upskill? But my focus on this paper came towards the last page or so where we were talking about recertification and the speed of change and then obstacles that were coming. So I'd like to focus on that for my time. Um, what I looked at is this quote towards the, uh, or statement, rather, not quote, on the obstacles page at the very end of this article, where it says 30% of HR um, businesses say their HR infrastructure will likely not be able to handle a uh, large change. Like they can't support the emerging skill gaps is how they worded it. And so that makes me think to capacity as you're looking at, okay, what's the next shiny thing? What's the next job description? What's the next thing that we have to create? Also think, do we have the ability to implement this change? Do we have the communication in place? Do we have the speed of processes in order to get these trainings going? Because if you say, yeah, in the next two years, we want to build you on this and see you working on this new job task, but we didn't give you training for it for a year and a half. Can we actually see you make any progress in those six months? Because then it's effectively what's going on. Lastly, the speed of it, looking at right before that obstacles section, we looked at recertification. And something stood out to me, which is, uh, let me pull up the paper and say it. So it says, for example, nurse practitioners provide patient care in the middle of the information age, which means the amount of knowledge they need to know to do the job will double approximately every three years or even faster, which is honestly a big thing to think about as you look at your HR infrastructure. Do we have the ability, again, to get these trainings faster and faster? And then if you send one manager or one you know, director every three years to get their certification redoubled, okay, they have all this new knowledge. How do you implement that into others and mentor to create a broad, okay, we sent one person to the seminar. What are they coming back with? It can't just be one person learning something new. It needs to have something in place to teach hey, here's what I learned. Here's something that can help us. And then also just in your organization, having the communication in place, 
which I think plays to both what Dr. Jeremy was saying and then Linda Ann about job crafting, working together on an innovative, collaborative work environment. Okay, we need this communication in place so that when somebody comes in with, hey, I just heard this new idea, this is interesting, at least giving the voice of, can we hear about this? What did you learn? Can this actually help us? And then again, doubling down on that HR infrastructure, can we put it in place? You know, you, you bring up the importance of communication. Do you think organizations generally are doing a good job in communication? Or is this another area that m- the majority of organizations could actually improve on? I would honestly say, I think that most organizations think that they're doing a good job, which is we're sending an email every single day about, hey, you're doing a good job. Here's this, here's that. But the real communication is in the difficult conversations. If you can sit in the table and say, hey, do we need to rehash everything that we do at our job? And people go, whoa, 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 that's my rent. you know. And there's a leeway in between because people look at it in extremes, blacks or whites. It's, hey, is this going to change everything or is it going to change nothing? And it's simple. But if you have the communication to sit in the gray together, hey, here's new information. How does this affect us? That's the first step. And most people say, oh, you know, hey, reskilling, upskilling, yes, that's going to be important. We'll get to that sometime in the next three years. It's on our strategic plan. We'll get to it. That's communication. But it's really not. It needs to be, hey, what you need to open it up, basically, is what I'm saying, to the gray, to the broad, and make sure that you're hearing from everybody's experience of how can we implement this? Because it's it's not just an email. It's not just we're working on this. It needs to be how are we working on this? And how can you as the worker from all the way from the CEO to the front line, how can you contribute to our culture changing in this way? Because this is happening. Yeah. And it really does make people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And Yes. It can change totally the complex and the culture of an organization. Uh, Dr. Martha, let's go to you. Something that Linda Ann brought up, the idea of having a person or, or a designated group of people who bring new ideas into the organization or alternatively watching those organizations who are the trailblazers, if you will, to see what are they doing? How are they moving forward and advancing? I think there's another piece that also deserves everyone's attention is actually asking employees within the organization to identify what do you think you need to learn? What do you think you need in order to improve, in order to be more efficient in order to be more uh, productive, whatever the case may be, because there will be instances where individuals can successfully identify things. They may not be able to come up with a specific training or specific tool, but they're in the trenches and they're doing the job every single day many of them will be able to identify what's lacking, what needs improvement. And that needs to part of be part of that bigger whole where we're not just relying on one or two people to bring in new information or just looking at the trailblazer organizations. What are they doing? Let's incorporate individual input as well because I think leaders and organizations in general may be surprised what individuals can bring bring to the table in terms of ideas, because sometimes you're so busy leading an organization, you forget that there's people in the trenches and they know a lot more than you do when it comes to the every day and how the job actually gets done. So I wanted to put that out there because I think that's an important piece of this greater whole. Did you find that's getting better? Cause you know, I, you know, think a hundred years ago, um, probably there wasn't a lot of managers who were asking their employees, you know, how do we make things better? Uh, But I've noticed it and heard it lots more maybe over the last five years. So do you think we're moving in that direction? I think so. First and foremost, it comes down to how good of a manager are you? The good managers seek out input from those around them, right? The good manager doesn't need to know everything and have all the skills and be the smartest. The good manager surrounds himself or herself with all of those people who are 
smarter and good at every other thing that the manager doesn't know how to do. So I think it starts with the individual leader or manager, but I think there's also a trend and people follow trends. There's a trend of seeking input from your workforce. So a hundred years ago, that trend didn't exist. Now it does. So that helps organizations go in the right direction. Yes. Grasp it and join the trend. Um, And let's go to Linda Ann. I have uh, uh, two points, and and I and I agree completely with Dr. Martha as far as you know getting those people, um, getting your all your employees more involved in the contribution process. And in some ways, I think that our leadership is is going to need to move to kind of an inverted model, where you are not you know previously leaders often had the most experience and most knowledge, and that's absolutely not the case anymore. And so what I think an effective leader needs to do is to gather or um, kind of coordinate some of the input and the knowledge of their team, right? And have that feed in. And then just you are guiding the process for utilization, for advancement and things like that. I think that, and so it's in, and and getting the obstacles out of the way, right? As far as as leadership, so that's kind of an inverted model. The other thing that to some of the questions that you had, Tom, about you know, what if they don't see their jo- job in in the in the list for three years from now? I think that one of the fears that people have about progress is it's all based in their current paradigm, right? And it's the what they're they're worried about, but not the how, right? And so if you think back 20 years and how we utilized information or how much access we had to information compared to today, it's, it's exponentially different. And so like what Aaron was mentioning about nurse practitioners needing to have um, double the amount of knowledge or, or something, it's, that that may be true that doesn't mean they have to do it or or perform in the same way that they're performing today there's ways to adapt and make the utilization of that knowledge or the access to that knowledge much easier and um applicable it's just out of a different paradigm than what we're used to today right well jeremy let me bring it back to you because you know what I'm hearing is that, you know, managers are probably in the best position to see where the changes need to go. They can have conversations with their employees and, and put together a really great plan. But at some point, you're going to have to talk to leadership. And that may be a difficult conversation. Um, so how do we encourage, you know, the leaders of the organizations to to join this movement and, you know, get the type of training to reskill and upskill their employees and, and build that better business. I was asked a question similar to this on organizational culture yesterday. And it's when you look at all levels, it's not the easiest question to answer. Something that sticks in my head. I was doing, um, I was doing a training, a a leadership development training for middle mid-level supervisors. And I remember one person raised their hand and said, this stuff is so applicable and amazing to learn. And we've been implementing it. Why are we learning to become great leaders? But this person said, why am I learning to become a great leader, but my boss isn't. And that's just always, that's just always stuck with me because it has to be a, you can't have that going on. You can't have employees feeling that way, but it has to, it's almost part of a, it's almost a culture thing because everyone, everyone's got a boss you know, no matter who, everyone's got a a boss at every level. And there's always that, there's always that fear. So it really, I mean, the short answer to that, Tom, is it's got to be a a shift, like a complete shift in the organization. This would be on that note of the communication aspect. I'm going to use this as a half decent segue to the shocker. So looking at this table where in this article where it shows the skills, uh, 
review of reports of top 10 skills on reskilling and upskilling future ready workforce. In 2020, you've got, well, it's, it's, you got, you got to kind of look at it because it's a little matrix here. But basically in 2015, let's put it this way, complex problem solving, coordinating with others, people management, critical thinking, negotiation are the top <clears throat> six. In 2020, the top six, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others. 2025, analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking analysis, creative originality and initiative. Probably hard to point out because I just wrote it off 18 things. In 2025, the people, the people parts just dropped. So people management didn't even make it. Coordinating with others didn't make it as one of the top skills in 2025. And the shocker is that, well, is this. So they don't even appear on that, like the negotiation and the people management. So now basically we're talking about communication, didn't even make the list. And it's a list of 10 items, the top 10. So the as they explain in the article, I'll read verbatim, as companies and managers increasingly use masses of data to make decisions based on data analytics, negotiation and people management retreat their position in the decision-making process. And basically they're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to do use decisions and support. So I'll go on soft skills in the cognitive scope, such as quality control, active listening and emotional intelligence considered core skills in 2015 disappeared also entirely on, on 2025. The newly emerging items are skills in self-management, like learning, active learning, resilience, stress tolerance, and flexibility. So, Tom, <laughs> people say, like, you know, your, your skilled workers technology is going to take all their jobs. Tom, I think you and I are out of a job for now because <laughs> when you look at these kinds of things, it's shocking. But when you look at it, like, let's take a different, a deeper look at it. It's not that these skills aren't necessary. It's that they're not being prioritized because typically the way organizations have used these skills in the past, emotional intelligence, active listening, negotiation, people management, companies have used these skills like for decision making rather than kind of how we look at it from an IO perspective. So it's not getting lost that they're not important. It's just because when you look at the goals of the company, when you in data and ana, data analytics and, and such can take the place depending on that particular goal. So unless there's a unless companies focus on the goals that we talk about in terms like you know, like your general IO topics in terms of employee retention, employee performance, employee development, these kinds of things that do save the company money. That's, I think, where the underlying themes are. But it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting to see this. I'll turn it back over to you, Tom. And then if you would just come back, because I wanted to attend to Madeline's question that she put in the chat. Sure. Um, you know, it reminds me of, remember that Brad, I think it's a Brad Pitt movie, Moneyball, uh, where everything was, you know, about the Oakland athletics and everything was on based on analytics that we're going to build a world, world championship baseball club just on the analytics. Uh, and, you know, all of a sudden every baseball team was using analytics, but now I'm hearing today, you know, analytics in baseball, it's a tool. You still need to have those people skill. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a little afraid that, you know, we're going to actually head in that direction. But I think once we get there, the pendulum will actually swing back and we'll be going, this is great information. Now, if we could communicate it, that would be a great thing. And let me tell you, chat GPT ain't going to do it for you. Um, so let's get back to Jeremy. Aaron, do you, do you still have a, you still want to pop in Aaron? Uh, sure. Yeah. I was just, I put my hand up for just a second because I think we've kind of talked at it with that, but it's, we were all mid process and I wanted to pose the question of, well, is this kind of a new trend? Like kind of what Tom said of, oh, well, you know, we've 
we've built our habits of communication and creativity. And so it's almost like with any change, all right, I've gone to the gym, I've got my muscle. Now I don't have to go to the gym anymore. Now I can look at this. And it's kind of that thought of, hey, what's this? What is causing this list to change to where others are falling off? And I think we've all were thinking a little bit of like, well, what's the reasoning behind it? And I don't think we can answer it, but it's a question that needs to be said of, you know, where did this change come from? Is it, okay, we're good at communication now. We don't have to worry about it. Or is it, oh, shiny new toy. We can lean back on the old processes of, like you said, however long ago, and I think it was actually stated in the uh, chat by Rich Cruz, it was more of the eye, the analytics about a hundred years ago is all the um, speed of efficiencies, you know, the book, the Toyota way coming out, how fast you can do things in factories. And now we lean more on the soft skills. Is it flipping back to, oh, this is the old safety or has it been long enough that it's something we haven't focused on for a bit? And as Tom mentioned, the pendulum back and forth. And Jeremy, do you want to come back to you or should we go to Jeannie? Uh, I can wait. Let's go, Jeannie. Jeannie, you're up. Um, well, I just wanted to um, mention here, you know, we're talking about communication skills and we're talking about teaching the skills. And um, I've recognized a lot lately where we have the frontline employees who are taught the skills, but are the leaders and the managers are, are they just as um, informed about what the frontline employees are actually learning when we differentiate between learning and development departments where they're the ones that are teaching it are we also educating our leaders and managers to the same points and are they getting the same messages because six sigma also teaches about um the voice of the customer. So what is the voice of the customer when looking at the frontline employees? If they're looking at healthcare, you know, their their jobs are patients um, as opposed to the voice of the customer of the managers and the leaders being the, the voice of the customer being the employees. Are their needs being met? Are they in a a uh, space where they can adequately learn and de develop and do that communication upwards and outwards to the front lines. Uh, that's a great question because you know what I've been seeing is uh, those frontline workers are trained really well, but the leaders are paying for it and going, uh, I don't need any training. Um, <laughs> where, really, really? Um, Dr. Jeremy, you know, once again, we come back to how do we have those conversations? It's great that frontline employees are getting training. They're being brought up to speed. But, you know, I also see lots of organizations who recruit really good people because, you know, they're doing a great job, but then they don't train them in leadership. You know, it, we just assume that if people are good at their job, they're going to be a good leader. Uh, and the same thing with this technology. How do we, you know, get the entire organization to embrace this? Because if leadership is not accepting this, if they're just, you know, it's, they're just checking a box, it's really not going to improve the organization. It always falls down. I, I, I say this all the time, primarily because I think it's important. It's, it's identifying self-interest. Because that's that's where it's at. Even if it's as simple as how can we make your day better today, tomorrow than it will be today? How can training reduce conflicts? How can training reduce, uh, uh, you know, customer errors in customer service? You know, when you're like five star hotel, you know, you have a preferred guest. You know, there might be some errors in communication there. Like so, you're right. So everything falls down to that bottom line, but also one's own development. So I think that's part of it. I also think part of it, because you mentioned check the box, which is just so important. Organizations do a lot of things and not without bad intent, not without good intention by just checking the box. And it's kind of like, if you're an organization, you might have 20 things that you want to do. Focus on three to five things in this arena, maybe even one or two, but just go, just laser focus on it, go, go hard at that, do it right. It, I go back to the quote in the book, I can't even remember. Companies all, never have enough time and resources, time, money, and, and other resources to do it right the first time, but they always have enough time, money, and resources to do it again. So, it, you know, that's kind of important. 
when you look at Matt, Madeline asked the question in the chat. Uh, I'm curious on people's thoughts on this. When it comes to LND, how can IOs and their leaders and leaders help employees shift their mindset away from the fear of performance evaluation towards development and learning from failure? This isn't an exact answer to that, but it brought me to something I want to read. <clears throat> it's uh, This article is called Risk Performance risk of performance and behavioral health that decrements due to inadequate cooperation, coordination, communication, and psychosocial adaptation within a team. And this is basically astronauts. This is a, this is a, it's on space psychology. And I'll, I'll put in a little plug here next. So it'll be the 28th on that Wednesday we have. And, and then the following week on the 5th of July, we've got two episodes coming out where Josh Duran and I, talk space psychology and IO together. So I think one is titled IO enters the cosmos. So those are um, ready to rock and roll. They're going to be live uh, on those two days. And for the article I'm referencing now, by the time you hear this, uh, that it'll provide the reference because we also reference this article. But I wanted to mention this in regards to success, performance, and failures. This is going to be a little long-winded but it's important. Two problems occur when focusing on performance errors. Errors are infrequent and therefore difficult to observe and record. Errors don't directly correspond to failure. Research reveals that humans are fairly adept at correcting or comp compensating for performance errors before such errors result in recognizable and recordable failures. So this is how it's related to Madeline's question about looking towards development and learning from failure, because again, this is where failure can be okay. Again, people can recognize failures um, and errors before they go really bad. Notably, because this is an article on space psychology, astronauts are notably adept high performers. Most failures are recorded only when multiple small errors occur and on and on. But when you look at this and think about it in an organization, Observers record variabilities and levels of performance. And this is true when you're a manager and you look at your job performance ratings. Some teams commit no observable er errors, but fail to achieve performance objectives or perform only adequately, while other teams commit some errors, but perform spectacularly. I think that is key because it's saying if you focus on not making a mistake rather than high performing and being able to make a mistake and correcting it before it goes bad, that's where you're looking at performance objectives, organizational objectives, and high performing team. Successful performance, therefore, cannot be viewed as simply an absence of errors or the avoidance of failure. And that was from the Johnson Space Center Joint Leadership Team. So I just think that's important, Tom. I got nothing else on that. Well, I was just going to say, you know, the, the importance as failure, a failure as an, you know, an educator is, is tremendous. Uh, when I was working in post-secondary teaching, you know, actors, I tried to, you know, instill in them fall, you know, this is the place you want to fall flat on your face and do it as many times as you can, but then just to remember to get back up and keep going. Uh, but we don't seem to have that same culture in the work world. Um, and I can see a lot of organizations going failure. No, we don't want any failure. So how do we encourage that? How do we, we, we tell business it's actually great when your employees fail because of the learning opportunity. I think about it and like, what's the perfect an FBI guy once told me the perfect question you can ask in an interview is, is basically say you have 60 seconds or you have 90 seconds. Please tell me an, uh, a time you made a mistake, what you did to correct it and what the result was. And you don't repeat the question because it's really what you did to correct it and what the result was. So I don't know. Organizations can, I I'm sure, uh, put some great minds together and figure this out. Maybe it's, maybe you add on your performance evals. Maybe it's where, Hey, where, what, where did you make a mistake and how did you correct it? <laughs> what was the result? Simple things like that, because what happens in organizations, if someone makes a mistake, someone's responsible. 
And when someone's responsible, it means that multiple people are responsible because multiple people are responsible for multiple people. And then there's this a lot of stuff and then it gets written up and all this yada, yada, yada. So it all goes back to com- organizational culture, which in a sense is, are your social norms. Social norms are usually unwritten, unspoken, and they're also reinforced in a way. So if you're leadership in an organization, how can you reinforce the ability how can you reinforce the importance of what happens after you make a mistake it reminds me i was in an airport i was on that uh you know so you don't have to walk the whole time you get on that straight escalator and then you feel bad (laughs) when you see the people walking and i saw this huge tiger woods poster it was enormous And it said, it's what you do next that counts. And Tiger Woods is basically like the balls in the pond, impossible shot, but it's what you do next that counts. So it makes me think of of that in a way. And when you look at just life in general, we can go back. I mean, we can talk about, we, we go back to that book, A Chance Encounter that I was talking about, where you don't look at everything. Not everything has to be looked at as a failure and you don't need to glossy it up. It you know, everyone has their like things that, you know, irk them a little bit. I dislike being in meetings when people say we have an opportunity with this particular individual when they mean challenge, just say it's a challenge. Yes, it's an opportunity, but say it's a challenge and then turn it into an opportunity. Just so, but it's about looking, not everything is detrimental. Not everything's the end of the world. It's what you do next that counts. How can you learn from it and how can you make things better? Because that's in our own, I mean, think about that. If that works in your own life on an individual level, that can work in organizations too on an individual team and department level. The path of failure to success. Uh, Dr. Marth, let's go to you. I think that selling failure to organizations can be difficult, especially when that's not already part of the organizational culture, because not all failure is created equal. Some failure can be very, very expensive. Some failure can be catastrophic. Some failure can cost lives. So we don't want to just say in a blanket statement that all organizations should embrace failure. Wow, if a few die, that's all right. That's not all right. I think a a better approach is to look for less painful failures as the points of where we learn within the organization so that those bigger catastrophic, more costly, potentially deadly failures don't happen, right? Failing at that level is not going to sit well with anybody. Nobody wants to be a part of that. Nobody wants that responsibility. So trying to sell that as an okay thing because it's a learning opportunity. I hope it's a learning opportunity, but the learning opportunity was much more important somewhere way before this happened. And I think that's what we need to focus on as IOs. This is where the organization needs to look for those smaller failures as a way of learning from them and preventing the catastrophic things from happening. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much for that. And Linda Ann, let's go to you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to reiterate a lot of what Dr. Uh, Martha said, and that's you know the, the incremental uh, risk opportunities. So it's not those costly things. And if you look at, you know, when a kid learns to ride his bike at six years old or whatever that is, and he falls a couple of times, scrapes the knee, maybe or whatever, it's not like you handed them the keys to the car, right? So <laughs> it's it's kind of that process where you're saying, okay, come to this meeting with me, be a fly on the wall. After the meeting, we talk about well, what decision would you have made or and you you give them those baby steps and and the next time that they can have you know contribute to the meeting and the time after that you you know and you do a, a debriefing and the time after that maybe they can lead the meeting or they can um do something else but it's an incremental process you don't just give them the keys to the car and say yeah i expect you to succeed Well, I was eight years old when my 
father put me on a tractor. So uh, sometimes it does work. Um, and by 12, I was driving a truck. But that's the thing, Tom. He gave you that incremental thing, right? He gave you the tractor. You couldn't hit anything. It was all corn or whatever it was, you know? <laughs> Oh, there were a few cows, but they moved too fast. Uh, well, Jeremy, with that, uh, I think it's time to wrap. Uh, but we've got uh, some great programming coming up over the next few weeks, and we are headed towards August and the conference. So any news you can share with us? Yeah, so the August three-day experience is uh, coming along very well in terms of putting it together. We're exactly where we want to be. So cbock.com slash events, you'll see it, August three-day event. And then we'll be having a super fun meetup at a super fun place in the like DC, Maryland area. All the details are that there, <clears throat> excuse me, on the website. And then next, so next week, Linda Ann and Brendan will be leading the charge with Tom, of course. The topic is virtual collaboration, mastering remote teamwork and communication. And coming up in July, so the July overall theme is applying IO psychology in your organization with really cool topics having to do with data-driven decision-making, workforce analytics, talent management strategies, succession plannings, uh, employee surveys, performance management, competency frameworks, and organizational diagnosis for all you org doctors out there. And don't forget, Lee does his weekly uh, marketing pop-up uh, group, which I hear is just growing and growing and growing. And Dr. Martha, where can we find your podcast? My podcast is on all of the major platforms. It's called uh, Workplace Psychology with Dr. Martha Grydek. You can find it on Amazon, Apple, iHeartRadio. It's also on my YouTube channel, which is Stress Free with Dr. G. So check it out. Tom, your audio cut out. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, well, I'm definitely going to check out those podcasts with Dr. Martha. And don't forget, you, you don't need to have a podcast to join us here every Thursday at 12 Eastern and share your voice on the Work Cookie podcast. And Jeremy, I think with that, we're a little over time. So why don't you count us out? Thank you, everyone. Great contributions today. Counting out in five, four, three, two, and one.